I, I do have a PowerPoint that I think might be helpful, uh, but I'll try to get started uh, without it. Um, I just want to, just to kind of frame some of my comments, my, my interest in, in environment and human rights is both professional and, and personal. I'm a native of the San Joaquin Valley, which you've heard a lot about uh, today. I'm from a small town in Merced County. Uh, I have stood at the water, local water mill filling up the jugs of water for our home. Uh, and I grew up in the, uh, during the scandal of the Kesterson Reservoir where the selenium contamination uh, had created deformations in, in local waterfowl. Um, so I really want to thank on behalf of my family and community uh, Ray and Caroline for the work that you do uh, in San Joaquin Valley, which is um, very much a forgotten area uh, of our very prosperous uh, state. Um, the, I, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep my kind of try to summarize um, my remarks. Um, but again, my experience and background in working with uh, immigrant communities and in human rights. Um, kind of got upended with uh, our, our clinic's collaboration with the UN expert on the human right to water and sanitation, and then the passage of the um, human right to water bill here, here in California. Um, the UN expert on uh, the human right to water visited California in 2011 and issued a report to the UN about her findings where she basically, uh, for lack of a better term, said she thought saw third world conditions throughout the state of California, primarily impacting low income communities of color, primarily rural Latino communities, tribal communities, homeless communities. Um, and it was really a, a, a wake up call and I think had a lot to do and kind of um, dovetailed nicely with the work of the Safe Water Alliance to kind of push um, the domestic legislation uh, forward. So even though I wasn't part of the legislative effort, once the legislation passed, our clinic tried to partner um, with the coalition and figure out, okay, now what do we do about this? And I think that's really what I wanna talk about today is human rights can be such a helpful organizing principle, but it only means something if we interpret it locally and domestically, right? So if your rights are violated, you don't get on a plane and go to Geneva, right? Uh, we have to make these rights real at home. Uh, but I also think that the power of it is our domestic legal system is very much a patchwork. Um, our state legislature, the Congress, you know, an issue is called to their attention, they pass a law, they amend a current law, and we kind of are in a reactive mode. And I think kind of the beauty of, of human rights is that it is, it's a newer area of international law, um, and it is uh, more comprehensive, uh, and integrated in its, in its approach. And I'll try to give you some examples using uh, the human right to water. Um, I just want to say one thing in terms of background around uh, international uh, human rights law. I think in the United States, we think of human rights as something happening in very far away places. It involves um, you know, torture in Afghanistan, uh, it, it, it's uh, you know, arresting political uh, opposition figures. Uh, we don't really think of it as uh, what we call economic, social, and cultural rights. So things like the right to health, the right to education, the right to an adequate standard of living. That is not really how human rights was originally conceived when the UN Charter and the UN Declaration of Human Rights um, came into being in the 1940s. All of those rights were integrated. So the right to health and the right to vote um, go hand in hand. If you are unhealthy, your, your ability to vote and the meaning of that vote is lessened. If you don't have the right to vote, your right to education is, is implicated. Um, so I think they're, they're uh, originally conceived of as uh, indivisible, interconnected, and one is not more important than the other. Uh, the kind of historical context in the US is that um, the Cold War made it so that the United States uplifted the civil and political rights, so things like due process and freedom from arbitrary detention. And uh, the Soviet Union was more interested in highlighting, thank you very much, no, no, that's great, uh, interested in highlighting the economic, social, and cultural rights, so things like the right to health, the right to work, uh, the right to education. And I think also kind of, uh, you know, uh, thinking about uh, the civil rights struggle in our country, you know, kind of our dirty laundry in the Jim Crow South around this time, we were also very hesitant to be become on the hook for other kinds of rights, 
um, and uh, kind of holding ourselves accountable for what was happening to African Americans um, at the time. So I think in other places in the world, people who are doing environmental advocacy, people who are uh, children's advocates, immigrant advocates, um, uh, working on behalf of workers' rights, they consider themselves human rights advocates. Uh, and I think in the US, we think of those people as doing social justice work or something else. So I invite you to think of all of this as part of, of, of human rights and human rights encompassing all, uh, encompassing all of those things. So this is the split historically that I was I was just uh, uh, referring to, and I think is our legacy here in the United States. Um, the human right to water. There isn't really. I'm, I'm going to use the human right to water to kind of highlight how I think human rights can help us guide effective policies and programs around um, environmental issues. Um, so I'm using it as an example, but I think some of the general takeaways um, are applicable in a lot of other areas. Um, the human right to water. It's not, there's not a treaty on the human right to water, but it is. Um, it has been found to be an essential component of the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to health, and the right to life. Um, and uh, the international community has spent more than a decade, about 15 years or so, thinking about what is this human right uh, to water, and the. The components of the human right to water um, are these, these five elements. They're really, um, again, like all of human rights, they're meant to be equally important and interdependent, and it's kind of a framework for states to think about policies and programs that will fulfill this right. Now, when you talk about international law, it has to be applicable in a lot of different contexts. So obviously what we would expect for water access in rural uh, you know, Manhattan is going to look different from what we would expect in maybe um, uh, you know, a rural area in Bangladesh, for example. Um, but there are certain general principles and guidelines that we can draw from, and I think that's going to be true in a lot of different areas. Just to give you some examples, so we're talking about you know, quantity, quality, acceptability, access accessibility, affordability. And what we've been seeing in California is there's tensions between these different elements. Um, so we address one and uh, a, a problem arises in the other. And again, that goes back to kind of our patchwork approach. We're, we're very much reacting uh, to problems as they come up rather than thinking comprehensively. And I think this is what the human uh, rights framework um, can be useful for. One example I would give you is you know, where water quality issues exist. I'm thinking of a, of a small um, unincorporated area in the San Joaquin Valley that had an arsenic uh, contamination problem. And they were able, after many years of struggle and toil, uh, to get funding to install a water treatment facility that would address that quality issue with the water. But the water rates became absolutely unaffordable for the community. And that water treatment facility is no longer functioning because it couldn't be maintained and operated by the community, which is a low-income farm worker community. So this is the kind of way, way of thinking in a broader, comprehensive way and seeing the interconnectedness of these issues can, can be helpful. So in our uh, you know, uh, domestic water policies, um, we think of what's the MCL, what's the maximum contaminant level? Um, you know, where's, where's the line in the sand? What can't we do? Um, but we don't really think about what affirmatively are we working towards? What are the elements of, of, of the policy and the and reality that we want to see happening on, on the ground? Okay, skipping quickly. Um, I just also want to mention um, human rights also has a helpful way about thinking about the obligations of the state. So human rights are held, are obligations of the state, meaning the federal government or local governments, toward its residents. Uh, and those uh, obligations fall into one of three categories. So the, the shorthand way that I teach my students to think about it is respect, protect, fulfill. So respect means the state can't do things that are gonna violate um, the human rights of its residents. So they have to refrain from things. Um, so not disconnecting water service for residents, um, especially low income um, or vulnerable residents would be one. We've seen mass water shutoffs in Detroit um, that to me is absolutely, um, you know, it's like a, 
uh, everything you should do <laughs> under the human right to water framework. Um, so respect means not doing things that are going to harm the human rights of your of your of your residents. Protect means you're protecting your residents from third party um, violations of those human rights. So again, an example in the Central Valley would be kind of recent efforts to uh, monitor and uh, limit um, the amount of nitrate contamination in groundwater. Um, so what is the state's obligation to protect the drinking water of its residents, um, and how can we kind of get ahead of the problem? And sometimes that requires uh, regulation of private uh, parties. And then fulfill is really the affirmative duty uh, on the state to kind of move forward to the most, um, in the most swift and to the maximum um, uh, capacity uh, available, um, given the resources of that particular government, um, to advance those different components of the human right to water. So again, in a global context, that means something different in a very wealthy nation versus a very poor nation. But the obligation is always to do something and to do it to the maximum uh, capacity of that given uh, state. Uh, I think human rights kind of uh, talks about a lot of the EJ principles that Caroline talked about that just uses kind of different uh, terminology. Um, but again, the kind of uh, non uh, the kind of cross-cutting principles of non-discrimination. So, uh, you know, in the U.S., we've done a pretty good job, not entirely, but our laws aren't kind of facially discriminatory, but the impact of those laws can be very, very negative for certain um, communities, um, as we've heard about today. So non-discrimination is, is a broader concept than just, you know, what's the letter of the law saying? It doesn't sound like it's, a, you know, a targeting any particular community. It can be what the impact is of those laws in practice. Public participation is also a really important uh, principle in human rights and also for, for EJ issues. Um, and when we talk about public participation, we mean meaningful public participation, not kind of the dog and pony show, like we had a community member who was there, but we never really took their input uh, into consideration, or we didn't really do outreach to the affected community. We had someone from another community involved in the decision-making process, but it actually is gonna impact a community in another location. Um, good governance and transparency, so access um, to decision-making processes and information in, um, in audience-appropriate format. Um, as an immigration attorney and a, a human rights uh, uh, lecturer, you know, getting involved in the in the water issues in California was like the most challenging, overwhelming thing ever. And I was reading reports, and my students and I we would get together, and we would actually, you know, break up reports into into sections and train each other to figure out, you know, what the heck is going on. So imagine if, you know, at uh, you know a law school uh, in the UC system were that perplexed, um, you know, people who are working, this isn't their job to, to decipher these things, um, how they're kind of navigating the information that, that the government's making available about their water. And then accountability, that we're monitoring and there's mechanisms of redress when people have problems so that the state works and is responsive. Um, I, uh, I, I, when we started this work, we heard a lot about, um, when we would go to Sacramento, we heard, well, you've got a fish problem and you got a people problem. And it was this idea that these things um, are in uh, tension. And I think um, some of the members of tribal communities that we've collaborated with have been very important um, sources and, and a voice in saying this is all interconnected. The answer is not that everyone has all the bottled water they need. If we don't have healthy water sources, um, that's gonna impact communities uh, downstream. But if we're also mucking things up uh, downstream, you know, we're all gonna live with the effects of that. So again, I think it fits nicely in with the human rights framework that we have to think of these things as interconnected and find the balance between the what sometimes look like competing interests in the long run. I don't think it are, but there may be points of tension um, along the way. Um, just, just to make uh, y'all aware of uh, what the human right to water law in California says, because I think it's, it's, it's a really historic piece of, of legislation, and I think the impact of it is still being 
um, um, felt around the state. But you'll notice um, the actual language of the, of the law is that every human being has the right to safe, clean, affordable, and accessible water adequate for human consumption, cooking, and sanitary purposes. So you really see the human right to water in those five elements um, that I mentioned previously reflected in the language of the state legislation. So again, our real challenge here is how to implement that. How do we make um, agencies um, and the kind of governance structure around water in the state responsive um, and thinking about um, those five elements and all the vulnerable communities um, that are impacted in different ways by different types of policies and programs and where are the gaps and where's the, where are the uh, gaps in our knowledge and where's the gaps in our response once we are aware of those problems. I think I'm going to end it there because I know we need, we need to move on. Um, I can stick around after if, if folks have questions. But thank you very much for your interest in this whole panel. And thanks to the panelists for all the great information.